Anthony Edwards from the University of Georgia. So Anthony Edwards with his mother and grandmother with him there in spirits. You know which hat he can take out of that big hot town and it's the one that belongs to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. This is our week five of a five week diabetes education series. Um, each week we've presented information on nutrition education, um, healthy cooking demonstrations, and also the physiology of diabetes. Um, and so tonight we have one more nutrition education session that will include information on gut health. Um, and that's being hosted by Jill Nusenau, who is a chef and also um, a registered dietitian who's been working with Mendonoma Health Alliance um, for about the last six months on various educational opportunities and workshops for the community. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys know a couple housekeeping items. There is a chat box at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to add comments in it throughout the presentation. This is being recorded, so you're welcome to afterward find us on YouTube by just searching Mendonoma Health Alliance and sharing the presentation with anybody that you think might benefit from it. And um, if you have any questions, you're having technical issues throughout the presentation, feel free to add questions in the chat box. And um, I will also go through and collect questions and. Um, We'll do a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and we'll make sure that um, there's time for Jill to answer your questions. Um, and there will be some links provided in the chat box as well for um, additional resources that you can download at home uh, closer to the end of the presentation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jill um, to the meeting. Here she is. Hi, Jill. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm just going to say, you know, a topic of great interest to me is gut health. Um, and it is something that we don't spend enough time on and something that I love to talk about. So I am going to go through the presentation. The beginning of the presentation is a review of just general good information on diabetes and health and nutrition. And then the second part is going to be about gut health. I'm kind of going to rush through the first part and spend a little more time on the second part. So I'm going to get up my PowerPoint and see. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, here we go. Nice. Here we go. Go go slideshow. I'm beginning. Here we go. Okay. So um, I'm just going to start, and I do welcome any questions you might have. So I really love this slide. It has impacted a number of people. I saw it online and I thought it was amazing. And it's basically, if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness and read that again. And I think one of the things is you really want to pay attention and you want to assess your uniqueness because we are all different. So whatever is unique about you is important. Now about changing behaviors, it's not easy. And so it's interesting because we just changed the clocks not that long ago. And I don't know about you, but it has been interesting for me to get my body to adjust to this change of behavior, which was not something I chose to do, but something that happened. And one of the things is the time that it takes. And if you are making a behavior change, you want to realize that one change at a time is great. It may take at least three weeks and maybe longer to stick. And your goals really want to be very specific. So you want them to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And you can pick anything. It could be something that you think, oh, this is ridiculous. But truly, it could be, I'm going to eat one meatless meal a week. And you have 21 choices, so choose any one, and that could work for you. I like to talk a little bit, because I'm a nutritionist and dietitian, about nutrients. And it's interesting because both protein and carbohydrate are four calories per gram, and fat is nine calories per gram. I don't also have on here um, alcohol. And alcohol is seven calories per gram, but metabolized differently in your body. So it really has a different effect than these other nutritive um, nutrients, the ones that provide calories. Also, there's non-caloric uh, nutrients, and that is fiber, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about, water, vitamins, and minerals, which are found in every food. And you'll see this little picture here, it says carbs are not a food group, they are one of the three macronutrients. And all the things that you see in the photos are all have carbohydrates. The interesting thing about foods is they are not generally just one thing or another. They contain generally some protein, some carbohydrate, and some fat. There are two exceptions that I like to think of, and one is more of an issue than the other. And that is that most fruit is pretty much straight carbohydrate and most oil, and this is where it gets the fruit, has some uh, protein, a little bit of fat, usually not. But the carbohydrate, the uh, fat, if it's oil, one tablespoon of oil has 120 calories. That's one measuring tablespoon, and it is 100% pure fat. So you want to keep that in mind when you're cooking and you're adding a tablespoon of fat. What is it doing to your food? What is it doing to you? And I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying think about it. And that's the whole thing about nutrition is it's important to spend a little time thinking. Because everything that you eat and drink matters. All your choices count. Um, you have a choice about what goes into your mouth. And I just listened to something today and they were saying, about kids and what they eat. And they said, well, kids don't go to the store. Kids don't, you know, buy the food. Do kids have jobs where they can make those kind of choices? But we do generally. So we're making the choice of what comes into our house, what goes into our mouth. So the choices that you have, or you can do the same things that you've been doing. And if you're not doing so well, then maybe that's not the best choice. You can eat less or have less of a food or drink. You can have that thing less often. You can leave it out altogether, or you can have it less often and you can eat less of it. And some people will say, well, I love cheesecake. I'm like, you can still love cheesecake. You just don't necessarily need to eat it every week or whatever the thing is um, that you really would like. You don't have to omit it, but you can have it less often or you can have less of it. And you want to make your environment foolproof. Foods are either harmful or they're helpful. And you get to choose which ones you want. 
So when you shop or if somebody's shopping for you, avoid bringing in foods that you know are not good for you and diabetes. And these are foods that I would say, you know, I'm talking about diabetes here, but these are foods that I would say some of them are not great for anyone. And we could start with the sweets and the candy, the donuts, the ice cream, the white foods like sugar, bread, white rice, some tortillas, refined carbohydrates and cereals with and without sugar, soda, and even artificially sweetened drinks, and juice, because juice consumption can really add up. If you think, if you've ever made orange juice and you've squeezed it yourself, you know that it takes probably at least two oranges to get maybe four or six ounces of juice. And you wouldn't sit down and eat those two oranges in the 10 seconds it takes you to drink that juice. And the sugar in the juice is absorbed very quickly. So things to drink, water with lemon or lime, unsweetened tea, green tea, herbal tea. And teas especially are, that are helpful are things with cinnamon, turmeric, or ginger. And the cinnamon especially because it does help regulate blood sugar. And somebody asked a question in the last talk or the presentation that I thought was interesting. And they said, well, if my blood sugar is low, should I avoid cinnamon? And I just want to point out that cinnamon doesn't work like a drug. And any food does not really work like a drug. A drug has one purpose. It may be to regulate your blood sugar. It may be to help you eliminate liquid so that you can regulate your blood pressure. But cinnamon will just work in your food and it's not going to make you your blood sugar goes so low that it's going to be an issue. So these are the herbs that you might want to use regularly and have them, especially if you like them, have them as an ingredient in your food or in your tea. And then label reading. I just attended a label reading talk, which was interesting. And really there was a lot of, um, a lot of talk about every nutrient. And I think, you can do that, but my number one tip for label reading is avoid as many foods with labels as you can. That's number one. Number two, look at the serving size before you eat or drink. My husband and I are often having this conversation about how many servings are in a package. He often disagrees and says, oh, there couldn't be just four servings because I just ate half the bag or whatever it happens to be. So look at that because that's what all the information that's on there is based on. And then look at the nutrients and the ingredients matter too. Are there ingredients that you can't pronounce? Is it a whole food? The names for sugar, learn these. Sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, coconut sugar, agave, fructose, honey, maple syrup, high fructose corn syrup, corn sugar, which is also high fructose corn syrup, molasses, and most of the words that end in O-S-E are sugars, and the ones that end in O-L are sugar alcohols. And I just want to comment that a lot of times sugar alcohols like xylitol and maltitol and those alls, they can interfere with blood sugar. So you really want to watch those and see if you're getting them. And the things that are in the pink packet and the blue packet may not be so great for you, even though they're non-nutritive and add no calories, they actually mess with your brain and they make you think, they make your body think that you're getting something sweet, but since there's no calories, your body doesn't react in the same way. And then I told you about juice, but also dried fruit is very nutrient dense. And then added oils and and fried foods that are either you fry or somebody fries for you and they're frozen and they're cooked. And then labels such as fat-free, gluten-free, low calorie, that doesn't mean it's good for you. It just means that somebody's trying to sell you something. So look at the labels. There's been like a whole, oh, I eat gluten-free. But if you're eating gluten-free and you're eating whole foods, that's one thing. But if you're eating gluten-free and you're eating cookies and cakes and candy or Pies and whatever whatever it may be, crackers, it may not be the best thing. So meals and snacks, the size and timing matter a lot. 
There's a lot of controversy these days about this, but I can say a few things that I know really make sense. And one is you want to avoid eating really high level carbohydrates at least three hours before you go to bed. So if you eat dinner at six and go to bed at 10, just stop eating at six, seven the latest. And you want to avoid snacking on high carbohydrate foods, especially processed foods, the ones that I already mentioned, things like crackers and chips and pastries and cookies and ice cream and other desserts and things like that, because those do mess with your blood sugar. And you want to eat regularly throughout the day. And that may mean you have three small meals. It may mean you have snacks in between, if that works best for you. And choosing the snacks that you drink, that you eat is really important, not just any old snack. And there are some things that are better than others. And then if you drink alcohol, when and how much? And I just listened to a doctor that I know and he said, alcohol is something that is not recommended. However, if people are gonna have a drink, then make it one or two glasses of wine or whatever it may be during the week or any time during the week, and like one at a time, twice a week, it, or have a limit, because those drinks can really add up, and what happens with alcohol is they tend to lower your, um, they tend to raise your desire to just do whatever you want, so you just want to pay it. And then I can't talk about nutrition without mentioning exercise, it's really important, and really, if you can't do anything else, if you walk 10 minutes after each meal, you will get a total of 30 minutes a day of exercise. And what happens is that when you exercise, walking is fine. And you know, if you're strolling and you start off strolling, that's fine. But if you can increase your, um, your aerobic capacity, that's better but it will help regulate your blood sugar. So it is recommended at least 10 minutes after every meal and that's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And if you have a large meal, because we have necessarily a large meal likely coming up at Thanksgiving and I'll just mention that for a minute, take a 20 minute walk, dance around or do anything that gets you moving, but only do what your doctor says that you can do and start slowly and be careful if you have limitations. Now it's interesting because um, Thanksgiving, other holidays are when people are like, oh, you know, it's just a meal, um, but it's a big meal. So you really wanna pay attention to how much you're eating at that meal, because that really will influence your blood sugar, will influence how you feel. So if you can make it so that you are not eating a lot at your meal, I can pretty much guarantee you, you will feel better in many ways because nobody, really, nobody I know really likes feeling stuffed, like that really like, oh, I love feeling and feeling kind of sick. So, you know, pay attention to what you're putting in your mouth. If you love stuffing and this is the only time you eat it, go for it. Just be moderate in what you choose. What I like to do, and my husband always tells me, oh, you're not everyone and I'm not. Um, I like to have some soup and I like to have a salad and I like to work around that because I just feel better and I do not like that really stuffed feeling. So I don't usually eat more than I want on any occasion because I remember that my body doesn't know the difference whether it's you know January 14th or it's December 26th or whenever Thanksgiving is. Um, or if it's Christmas, which is December 25th. My body doesn't know any of that. It just knows it's having a meal. So I try to be very kind to it. So here's where things get interesting. And I like to talk a little bit about mindful eating because I talk about this fairly often. Your fork is not part of your hand. And I grew up in a family where I don't know, my father ate fast. I think my mother would have preferred to eat less quickly, but the fork just stayed in the hand and never went anywhere. And so it's part of mindful eating to actually let go of your fork or let go of your spoon. And there is another part to this, which I will briefly talk about, but 
let go of it because it will slow down your eating and eating more slowly actually helps with a lot of things, but it takes about 20 minutes for your brain to register what went into your stomach. And this is all part of gut health. So if you can let go of the fork, it gives you an opportunity to chew well. And chewing well is very, very important. And one of the reasons is, and I'm gonna talk more about this, because digestion begins in your mouth. And because digestion begins in your mouth, you want to make sure that you get your food chewed well. And there was a saying, you know, chew, your, chew each grain of rice a hundred times. I'm not talking about that. But it may be good to actually pay attention to how much you're chewing and how often you're chewing. And you chewing all your food before you're getting the next bite. And if you remember what I said about changing habits, it is um, important to think about this because it may take a while before number one, you let go of the fork, and number two, before you start chewing really well. And I know from my own eating that it really takes some work. So a lot of times after I do this talk, people will come up to me or they'll see me and they'll say, oh, I listen to you. I put the fork down and, you know, pat yourself on the back because it really is not easy to do that um, if you're not used to it. Now, I have eaten with people who eat much more slowly than I do, and I often think, I thought I was eating kind of slowly, but there's lessons to be learned. I can't say necessarily that people who eat more slowly, I don't know of any studies on this, that people who eat more slowly actually eat less. I would hope so, but I don't know for a fact. So I would say, put your fork down and chew well because it really can matter. So your digestive system is a tube that starts at your mouth and ends at the end, which is your anus. And this whole little tube here has a lot of moving parts. It is the largest part of your body. It covers a whole lot of area. And it's, as I said, it starts in your mouth. It goes down through your esophagus. And there is, um, it's called the esophageal sphincter. And what it does is it closes. So, it, and if you've ever had heartburn, and I have to say, until I was pregnant, I didn't even know what heartburn was. And when I had it, it could come from anything. It could have been a glass of water. But what happened is I had so much baby in there that it was pushing on that sphincter and the contents of my stomach were coming up and the stomach acid, which is good, you don't, you want that, started coming up. So there is a special little valve there to keep the acid in your stomach. So one of the things is sometimes if you have GI issues and they are common, at least 25% of people say that they have gastrointestinal is issues and there's more that happen on an irregular basis. And they can happen starting from your mouth, going down into your esophagus, going into your stomach, which releases hydrochloric acid, which is good. But if you take Tums or Pepsid or any of those types of things, it neutralizes the stomach acid. So that isn't what you need to happen because the stomach acid is there to help you digest the food. Your food goes from your stomach into your small intestine where not that much happens in your small intestine. And I'll talk about what happens in your large intestine. And that is many, many feet of intestine there. And so it's hard to believe what's really in your body. But remember, starts at the mouth, ends at the end. So one of the things that's interesting, and this is where all the gut talk really happens, is how does food influence your gut? And there was a 2001 report by the Food and Agriculture Organization, and it defines probiotics as live microorganisms, which when consumed in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. You are the host. They are good bacteria. That's what probiotic means, good bacteria. And so there's a lot of confusion about probiotics. 
the probiotic industry is huge. And when I talk about probiotics, I don't talk about taking pills or powders or supplements. I'm talking about the good bacteria that you have. Now, there are prebiotics, which are your food. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. And here's a quote from a fellow dietitian, and she says that she's convinced that probiotic use in most people can enhance their immunity, and I'll talk about immunity, promote regularity, lessen gas and bloating, yes, even enhance their sex life. And I like to add, it might clear up your skin too, because it's all, we're one body, we're not parts of a body. So anything that helps one part of your body will generally help another part of your body. Many people though have a damaged gut lining. Your gut lining is only one cell thick. So think about that. You can't even see it. I don't know what it looks like, but I know that's very, very little and very thin. So there are all kinds of things that can happen in your gut that can cause issues. And when something happens in your gut, it will affect many other parts of your body. So if you are unable to eat certain foods, it may be that you have a gut issue that needs clearing up. And it's kind of easy to tell when this happens because things don't go quite right. Um, and, you know, but what, with that said, what I wanna say is that if you have um, diarrhea or constipation, or you are vomiting, that is your body's way of helping you. So we look at it like, oh, I gotta stop this. If you have ever eaten any, well, I'll just say bad food, like spoiled food, something is going to happen. Usually not constipation, because that's not what your body wants to do. It's either you're gonna start vomiting or you're gonna have diarrhea or you're gonna have both. And if that happens, then it's your body's way of saying, I have to get rid of what this is. Your body does not want poison in it. So have to remember that because we think, oh yeah, I have diarrhea, I've got to take that emodium. Well, all that's doing is keeping whatever's not good in your body. And if you have chronic diarrhea, that is a problem. And it's something that you really need to look at and see what is causing that irritation in your body. If you have chronic constipation, which I think in some ways is easier to deal with, but it's not so easy to deal with for some people. All of this relates to your innards, your actual gut. And remember that whole thing from your mouth to your anus is all your gut, but I'm gonna be talking specifically about and the interesting thing about your gut is your gut is your immune system command center. It's responsible for the regulation of responses, particularly of inflammation. And more than 70% of immune function takes place in your gut. So you can see if something's not working right in your gut and nobody's giving you a gut checkup, and this is part of the issue, um, is that we don't really know what's happening in there. And we don't have to know as long as everything's working well, but if things are not working well, you want to have an idea of what might be happening. But more than 70% of immunity takes place in your gut. And the way to take care of it is fairly easy. Um, and also, remember I told you the stomach puts out hydrochloric acid and that is to neutralize things. But sometimes, where things get not so good is beyond your stomach. The body will encounter the majority of pathogens, that's things like viruses and bad bacteria, and there's some other things too, in your gut, and that can be in your small intestine, it could be in your large intestine. But remember that inflammation serves a protective role. We think it's a bad thing, and it is when it's chronic, but when it's not chronic, it's your body's way of responding to tissue injury or infection so that you can heal. So in diabetes, there are some things that it, it's a chronic disease and there are ways to help make things better. I just wanna mention a little more about probiotics. 
It's a microbial organism. And sometime, and right now, with all of the antibacterials, we are thinking, oh, we don't want any bacteria. Well, a virus is a different thing than bacteria. And it's a microbial organism, which is not harmful. It remains alive during processing and the shelf life of food. Um, it has to survive digestion and remain viable in the gut. And this is where some things are not so easy to do um, because probiotic capsules and pills and drinks and so on may not work. And it is able to bring about a response in the gut and associated with health benefits. And the biggest issue now is that with most things in science, the criteria are continuing to develop, and they just really started uh, investigating the gut in the last 10 years or so with the Human Microbiome Project. And not all cultures remain active, so you, you don't know what you're getting. That's the main thing. So we have prebiotics. Prebiotics are the things that you eat to actually feed the good bacteria in your gut. And the interesting thing about these prebiotics is that generally, if you have a gut issue, these are the things that will cause you problems. And so um, I just wanna go over them so that you know there will be a list, a PDF of some of these. And I like to talk about the ones that are actually foods that you may eat, because there are some things that are things you're like, what's that? You don't have to go out of your way to get them. But you've heard an apple a day keeps the doctor away. An apple is a good source of prebiotics, as are berries and raisins. And But you have to, this is where nutrition gets interesting. So an apple is great. Berries, with, especially with seeds, are really good, but raisins, a small amount of raisins is a lot of sugar, so you want to pay attention. And this banana generally is a banana that is more green than ripe. And I don't know about you, but I would not be eating green bananas. So when you eat a banana, you want to eat it less ripe than more ripe or eat less of it. Um, but the better prebiotics in, in a green banana than a ripe banana. And so no spots on that banana. Um, and then things like onion and garlic and leeks, which are called alliums, um, are all good sources of prebiotics. Jerusalem artichoke, globe artichoke, asparagus. And then I have to tell you, I've never eaten chicory root, but I do have a drink called Ticino that I drink that has chicory root in it. And uh, coffee in New Orleans has chicory root in it. So it's not common. And then maybe you've never heard of burdock or yacone. They're both root vegetables. And so you don't have to go out of your way to eat the things that you would not really eat. Um, jicama is a good source of prebiotics, tomato, greens of all types, kale, greens, chard, kale, mustard greens, and then dandelion greens, which many people don't eat and salsa fee, which is not something that you're gonna find every day anywhere. Probably there are others too, many of the root vegetables um, like parsnips probably are really good sources of prebiotics. And then all your legumes, dried beans, peas, lentils, um, they could be in a can, you can cook them from dry. Those are all really good. And then whole grains, pretty much of any type, whole wheat, barley, rye, spelt, kamut, um, those are all good. Oats show up as good things to eat everywhere on every good list because they contain soluble fiber. Brown rice and any other colored rice, whole grain corn, buckwheat, and then seeds such as flax seeds and almonds. So these are all the foods that are gonna feed the good in your small intestine, important part. So fermentation takes place in your lower, lower bowel. And what happens, I'm gonna show you a chart about resistant starch. What happens is you have basically three classes of bacteria in your gut. I wanna mention there was a study in um, 
that was done comparing Italian children to children in a place I had never heard of called Burkina Faso. It's a country in Africa. And the people in Burkina Faso actually had, the children had much better digestion than the children who lived in a city in Italy. And that is because they were eating many, many more plant foods and with great diversity and variety. And that is one of the really important things. And you'll hear me say this fairly often, but this fermentation is good. And some people are like, well, I get a lot of gas. Well, that's because your body is not able to process what you've put in. Remember that one cell thick wall lining there. And if things go through, and also you can't just go from zero to 100 without in between steps. Maybe you can go from zero to 60 quickly if you have a Tesla, but otherwise you're not going that fast. So one of the things is you're going to have these acids and gases, and it results in benefits. It, you decrease the pH level in your um, large intestine, gives you more acid, and when there's more acid, you get less disease, bacteria-friendly environment. So you're going to get better bacteria. The other part is a little more complicated, and you get short-chain fatty acids, and it enhances the best bacteria and might actually help uh, have an effect, a low effect on colon cancer, which is really interesting because you want more of those short chain fatty acids. What's happening is you are feeding your bacteria the food that it needs, which are the foods that I just told you about. You also have enhanced mineral absorption from those good bacteria, basically calcium and magnesium. It might help lower cholesterol and it might help stabilize blood glucose levels. So the more good of these um, bacteria that are going to be eating the, the uh, fermentation uh, byproducts, the better. It will enhance your immunity and you'll have a positive immune response and usually helps with bowel function and elimination. And I just wanna mention constipation for a minute because uh, this is something that you need to know. When you eat more of these foods, which tend to be high fiber foods, you need to have more water. And that is because you need things to be moving through your system. So you need a certain amount of water. So this, the food that I'm talking about is called resistant starch. And what happens is you eat the food, you have the starch in the small intestine, it goes out, what is left is called resistant starch. The resistant starch feeds your bacteria and you get a prebiotic effect in the small intestine. And what happens is you end up with these short chain fatty acids which produce something called butyrate. And the butyrate helps lower the pH in your large intestine. It's a beautiful system and it works. But what you need to know is it doesn't work overnight. It takes time to get there. So these, I mentioned them, I'll mention them again, legumes of all types. Winter squash is incredibly good and we happen to be in winter squash season. Um, oats, starchy foods. And here's the thing about starchy foods. If you cook them and you chill them, you are going to get a more resistant starch than you will if you eat them hot. So if you cook a whole bunch of potatoes and then you reheat it, you're not going to have that same oozing starch. Um, potatoes, pasta, sweet potatoes, barley, wheat berries, other whole grains. And one of the interesting things about that is if you think of, the, so there's a whole thing about glycemic index, and I don't really go into that because it can be really confusing because candy seems like it's better for you than carrots which I'm not gonna buy on any level. Um, so I'm not gonna go there, but if you think of potatoes, I really love to think of potatoes. If you think of a potato that you just bake, or I like to pressure cook them, they're whole. You know, you've got that whole potato. If you took the potato and you cooked it, let's say you steamed it, it's a little more cooked because you have more surfaces that have been exposed to steam. If you take that potato and you peel it and you boil it, 
and then you have boiled potatoes, you're gonna have more starch coming out. If you take potato and you boil it until it's really, really soft and mash it, you are going to have the most starch possible except for that box of potatoes where you add liquid to it because that's gonna be the starchiest. Those foods are going to be, the, the more processed foods are bad sources of resistant starch. So the less processed foods, the better. Potato starch, this is a fascinating one. And I'm not talking about potato flakes, I'm actually talking about a product called potato starch, which you can buy. You can add to your food in uh, a couple of two, three tablespoons if you like. Um, and it doesn't have much taste. I don't use it because I would rather eat food. Um, you can get something like green banana flour, which you could use in your baking, which will up resistant starch, or you can eat green bananas or plantains if you like them. Um, and so that is really interesting to take a look at those. And then there are also things like flaxseed and chia seed and psyllium husk, which may not have resistant starch, but they are great sources of fiber. But here is the key to healthy gut, is the diversity and the number of different foods that you eat matters. So if you are someone who likes sweet potatoes and broccoli, and you eat that all the time, I'm gonna suggest that you eat some other foods. Maybe have some Brussels sprouts, maybe have some kale, maybe just have lettuce, because diversity matters. Remember, you are feeding these good bacteria and they don't wanna be fed the same thing all the time. So you want to change things around. And when I did mention other whole grains, I mentioned spelt and kamut, and it could be um, millet, it, you know, and also um, uh, steel cut oats, those are all good, but whole oats, anything whole is gonna be better than anything cut. But however you can get these foods into your mouth is really good, into your mouth, well chewed, and then go on from there. Here's the interesting thing. You know, people say, I have a gut feeling. Well, there is a connection between your brain and your gut, it's not one way. And so what happens is, and this is important because if you look at the chart and you start from the left, you'll see that, that stress, dietary or environmental triggers change what happens in your, in your microbiota. I didn't use the word microbiome once yet, so it's time. Your microbiome is your whole system at the beginning, at the end, it's your microbiome. So what happens is stress, dietary or environmental changes will affect your microbiome. And so you want to pay attention to that. And then if you look, I'm gonna go to the right, and then you have gut epithelial breakdown or leaky gut, and there's many, many causes of leaky gut. And then what happens is you have immune activation, okay? Um, by bacteria that are not good, that are trying to poison you. And then it goes down to, you have an inflammatory cytokine production to it, things cross your blood barrier. And then you have altercations or neurotransmitter levels go down. And then you have changes in your brain. And then we get back up to the neural behavioral and movements and then back up to stress, dietary, and environmental triggers. It's a system. And so your GI tract really will influence your central nervous system and things can go very wrong, very wrong. So a big thing in any kind of chronic disease is to manage stress. And you can manage your dietary intake. You can learn to manage stress. It really does make a difference. So. Sometimes, you know how sometimes you get upset and it's like, oh, my tummy hurts. So it's not imaginary. It may actually hurt because things are not working well there. 
So it's not a one-way street. You can influence it. You can change things. And I have to say, I have had some gut issues in the past. And when I do, I take fairly drastic measures to change things. Because what happens is sometimes your gut bacteria tell you, feed me sugar, feed me sugar, feed me sugar. And you think, oh yeah, maybe I just want something sugary. But it's your gut bacteria telling you that because they want to be fed. And that's to get the bad bacteria to outnumber the good bacteria. So when something happens and you have some kind of situation where things are not going well, you may want to do just the opposite. And usually for me, that means miso soup and lots of greens and really giving my gut a break instead of putting more things in it that can cause more damage. And it may just be a day or two. If it's longer than that, you wanna to talk to your doctor, but our gut often tells us what's going on, so we really need to pay attention. And here's something really interesting, and with bacteria and diabetes. If you have diabetes, you may have less vitamin B12 and vitamin K produced because vitamin K is produced in your gut. And in pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, you may have a decreased mucus barrier in the gut. And um, here are the things that help. Inulin, it is added to food, so I'm not recommending that you go out of your way to eat it um, or find it, but it is in some foods. It is also the biggest source of um, inulin is in Jerusalem artichokes. And so this is the time of year when they're around. And so you could get some Jerusalem artichokes. Don't eat too many, they can cause gas but they also are very good. I like to eat them raw and put them on my salads. I will mention something about eating raw food in a minute. Beta-glucans. They are in um, oats and apples, um, mushrooms. And I didn't mention mushrooms, but I do want to say mushrooms are a great source of beta-glucans, and I highly recommend mushrooms. And anthocyanin-rich polyphenols, which are in... Um, a lot of your fruits and vegetables. And this is all food. And here's the whole thing. The studies show, and I have to say, mo many of the studies are not large enough for me to like really start jumping up and down, but they show that there can be changes in your gut microbiome in four weeks. So it may take longer if you're making a lot of changes, but you really need to start slow because what you're doing with these various foods is you are increasing fiber. And you can't go from eating five grams of fiber a day to eating 40 grams of fiber a day without issue. So you wanna pay attention to that, but you can do it fairly slowly over a period of time and it may be beneficial. There are also the Human Microbiome Project, what they found is that the microbes in your mouth, there are a number of places that microbes exist, how about all through your body? can predict what's in your gut, but we're not all the same, so it may not be the same. Bacteria that's in your gut may be making you fat or thin, and we share bacteria with other people. And it's really interesting. Um, they have a thing called a fecal microbiota transplant, and there's a story on NPR about a woman who needed to have this because her gut was so compromised, and she, I can't remember if it was her daughter or somebody related to her, she got this gut microbiota transplant and she had never had an issue with weight. And then she did. She was still grateful to have her gut healed, but she really had a hard time losing weight. You can change the, micro, the microbes that are in your gut, but it does take time. And so you want to really look at the foods that will help. So I say food is the answer. What is the question? What's the best way to get your prebiotics and probiotics? Um, the probiotic foods that you can add come from around the world. Um, the most commonly known ones are miso and natto from Japan. If you don't know natto, my uh, motto is no natto for me because I don't really like it. But I do like miso, it tends to be salty, but you can use it instead of adding salt. 
there's kimchi from Korea, and we have companies in the US actually in, um, in you know, locally who make uh, kimchi and sauerkraut. Um, kombucha is a little bit different than the others because it is not a vegetable product, it is a drink. And then sauerkraut from Germany and curtido from El Salvador. And you can make your own water keepers and fermented vegetables. It's not that hard, but you don't have to. You can go to the store and buy them and you use them like condiments. You don't use them like food. So you wanna just add them to your food. And I like to say that food choices matter. Every bite you take is either fighting disease or feeding disease. And what you see on the left are lots and lots of vegetables. And what you see on the right are more commonly things that eat that people eat. Um, I do want to say that processed foods generally are very low in fiber. They don't feed your gut well, and they may actually have compounds in them that are detrimental to you and your gut microbiome. So you really want to limit these kind of foods and eat more whole foods, which are come from plants. Plants really are the answer. So I like you to focus on what you can control. I like you to treat your body like a temple or even better, like a Mercedes, even if you feel like a Honda or a Toyota or other non-luxury car. You want to feed your body with the highest quality antioxidants and nutrients and foods that you can because it really does make a difference. Um, you know, at your gut microbiome, it is so obvious that what we eat matters. It's not like, oh, maybe what we eat matters. What we eat really does matter. Now, you can go for quite a long time eating food that may not be the best for you. And I just want to mention that I've been doing a lot of research, and in the last 60 years, from 1960 on, the rates of obesity and chronic disease have skyrocketed at the same time that the incidence of processed food and fast food has gone up. I do not think that it is a coincidence. I think that is the reason. And if you think about, if you can remember what the frozen food aisle used to be, it would be frozen peas and corn and you know, yes, maybe there were a couple of, you know, dinners and things, but now it's amazing what you can get in the frozen food aisle. And I, I do want to mention one other thing, because I didn't mention it, and I think it's important to note, is yogurt. Because I was just interviewed, and they, we were talking about yogurt. And um, I said, looking at the yogurt in the store, it's kind of mind-boggling you can kind of be like, oh my goodness, what am I going to choose? So here's what I recommend because people are like, oh, I eat probiotic foods. I eat yogurt every day. Well, most of the yogurt is highly processed, highly sweetened, and may not actually have live bacteria. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with yogurt. But if you're going to get yogurt, the best yogurt to get is one that has the lowest sugar or no sugar. So plain is the best. You could add fruit to your yogurt. You could add something sweet to your yogurt if you like. I personally like yogurt in a savory way, so I don't I prefer no sugar in it at all. But read the label because a lot of times those little containers of yogurt, which may only be five or six ounces, will have many grams of sugar in them. So Yogurt is not necessarily so great for you if you're consuming it that way, as opposed to others. Um, and so the answer to all of this is to eat more plant foods in many different ways. But I mentioned that I would mention eating raw food. And I want to mention that sometimes if you have had some gut issues, if you think you're having gut issues, you may not be able to eat a lot of raw food to start. And you may need to eat your food in a more cooked form than you would like to think. So if you need to eat your food in a cooked form or you need to eat your food in a blended form, that's okay, you're starting. You're still feeding your gut. You're just not feeding it 
uh, the same way that you will be able to if your gut heals. It can take anywhere from three weeks to six months to really heal your gut of issues. So think about that. Sometimes people tell me, I cannot eat beans. They really don't work for me. So what I would recommend is if that is for the case for you, that you could sprout your beans. And oftentimes people will sprout their beans and then cook them and find that they are able to digest them. But the key is to include as many of these high prebiotic foods that exist. And prebiotic generally means foods from mother nature and foods that came from plants. So I thank you for listening. I have recipes on my website for making sauerkraut and pickles, plus something I like fermentillas. Here's a link to um, fermented vegetables. You can get your own starters if you want to make your own yogurt. And um, I also currently on my website have an article about prebiotics and probiotics and your gut, because this is something that I think is the, it's the cutting edge science that we're just really beginning to learn about that I think is so um, important because your gut really rules your body and your mind. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, I want to ask a couple questions that were in the okay. chat as you were presenting. Um, one of them is, uh, when you were referencing the, the age of the foods you're eating, what if apples, um, what if the apple is older, is it still viable as a probiotic? And it does that apply to vegetables as well? Well, you know, I mean, I would say you want to have the highest quality that you can have. Apples, actually, it's funny because apples are something that lasts a long time and it may have less nutrition, but as far as like prebiotic qualities, it's probably fine. And, you know, it get into this whole thing about, oh, you know, if the carrot is two weeks old, just eat it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to because this is really all about fiber. And getting fiber is so important and getting many different types of fiber every day is really important. So if your apple is older, oh well, it's still an apple and it's still gonna be useful. So, um, and remember eating an apple is better than eating apple sauce. Um, and so, it, you know, the more whole the food, the better. And, but getting any of it is better than getting none of it. If you're choosing applesauce over ice cream, Hooray, hooray, because that's really a better choice. And then another question, you mentioned um, sprouting your beans. Can you talk about what that means? Yes, absolutely. So um, what you do is you take your dried beans. You can put them, I don't have my mason jar lid here. You put them in like a mason jar. You fill it with water um, and then overnight, and then you dump the water out. Um, you can get a sprouting lid. You can use a piece of cheesecloth. I have used a uh, paper towel if need be. And what you do is you take that jar and you put it into a bowl with the, with the um, soaked beans and you just turn it on its side and I have to put it in a cabinet and you rinse it twice a day. Um, if you have a sprouting lid, it's really easy. You can do it right through there. If you have cheesecloth or paper, take it off, rinse it, put it back on. And after two or three days, your beans will get a little sprout on the bottom. And um, it makes them much more digestible for people who have issues with beans. Um, and you, may, you, if you have it, gut issues, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend eating them raw, but you can except I do wanna mention any beans in the kidney bean family, such as cannellini beans or kidney beans or flagellate beans, you should not eat raw. You should always cook those. But the other ones you can eat raw if you're looking for ways to increase your, um, your prebiotics, you can sprinkle those on your salad. They're really delicious. Um, but if you're having gut issues, you sprout them and then you cook them and they will be much more digestible for you. And 
Here's the interesting thing about that. What you want to keep in mind with increasing these fibers is you do want to start slowly. So it may be that you open a can of beans or you cook some beans, and then what you do is you eat one tablespoon three times a day for three weeks. So here's what you need to do if you do that. Your beans are only going to last and stay fresh, even from a can, three or four days. What you can do is you can freeze the rest of the canned beans, and I freeze beans all the time, and then take out the small amount that you're going to need in the next few days. So just one tablespoon three times a day for three weeks can help your gut adjust to eating more beans. If it becomes intolerable, stop, because your gut won't be ready. So. Perfect, thank you. And then um, I want to let everybody know really quickly that there is um, a PDF available on our website at Mendonoma Health. I'm going to share my screen very quickly and show everybody how to get there because there are questions um, sometimes about how to download things. So this is our website where you can find, um, I'm just gonna go here on our drop down menu. You're gonna go to the calendar. On the calendar, um, you're going to scroll down to today's date, November 18th. Click on the option there. And then you're gonna see the flyer for today's event. Below that is a PDF that Jill has provided with um, some information that you can take with you. You're welcome to come view this on our website whenever you'd like. You're also welcome to download it. There is a um, option right here at the bottom in this gray bar to download the file. Once you download it, you can print it. I believe you can also right click on the image and just select to print the document. So I will stop sharing. Well, that and, is a good tip there. <laughs> yeah, and the direct link to get to the website I posted in the chat box. Um, you can also just Google Mendonoma Health Alliance and our um, website will pop up. Um, so that concludes our five weeks of diabetes education. And um, Jill, I just wanna say thank you so much for your time and this recording will be made available on YouTube for anybody to share. Um, so have a great week and wonderful Thanksgiving. Lots and lots of plants to everyone. <laughs> All right, bye everyone.